Oh my goodness. I, I already see some people I know, like Tom Travisano. Mm, how wonderful. Hi, Tom. I'm not so good at figuring out who's here. I'm on maybe, I'm on a sort of laptop with not a very big screen, so. Well, uh, me, me too. Oh, Marita, hi. Uh, Somerville librarian, oh. following in, in noble footsteps. <laughs> Hi, Megan. Hi, Lloyd Francis. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Dave. Alice Dave. Quinn. Hi, Alice. Oh, oh thank Lord. you. Richard Hoff. Oh, my goodness. What so Richard's class is coming. So we have to know oh, that there Lord. are people who really know Bishop listening to us and people who are new to Bishop. So I hope Dave everyone will, will bear that in mind as we talk. We just wandered over here from our classroom. So oh, we're all here. Oh, wow. Oh, my goodness. I see a, a, there David are several Hirsch. Bishop people in the audience. David Hoke. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dave. Hi, Lloyd. Hi. Hi, Richard. And there's David. Yeah, Richard's teaching a poetry uh, literature class this semester, which is Richard's last semester. He's retiring as well. You're retiring. No, you're too young to retire. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful last semester, though. Really been great so far. Good. My my very last official class was a was a bishop seminar. And you're going to reprise some of that this evening. Well, I, I guess there will be some, some things may overlap. <laughs> yeah, that was the whole semester, a whole bishop semester. Yeah. That Lloyd. Yeah. Boy. See you, Lloyd. Who said that? That's Stephen sneaking in from the corner. Oh, wow. Okay, so I I can't, let's see. Oh, 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 ah, Marvin, <laughs> oh, I, so many. Oh. Nice oh, to meet you, hi. hi. <laughs> Scott, another, another Emerson person. Mm -hmm. John Pajewski, hi. Jeff Harrison is here. Steve Vertiner. So Steve Weiner, can you see how far along we are in, in admitting people? Are we sort of, does it happen all at once? We, we got, I think we should get, just get started. Okay, great. Okay. Great. So I want to yeah. thank you all for coming. I'm Steve Weiner. I'm the former director of the Maine Republic Library. And mm -hmm. today we present a celebration of the life and the work of Elizabeth Bishop. And we're delighted to have a couple of eminent speakers. The first one is Megan Marshall. And Megan is a professor at Emerson College, and she's the author of many books, The Cost of Loving, Women in the New Fear of Intimacy, The Peabody Sisters, Three Women Who Ignited the American Romanticism, Margaret Fuller, A New American Life, and Elizabeth, and Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast. And she's been awarded the Pulitzer Prize, the Francis Parkman Prize, the Mark Linton History Prize, and the Masters Book Award. And, our, and joining her is Lloyd Schwartz, with a former professor at University of Massachusetts in Boston. And Lloyd is a poet and, a, and Elizabeth Bishop scholar. He's the author of several books, um, and which uh, the first one, he's the co-editor of Elizabeth Bishop and her art. He also serves as co-editor of, of the an edition of the collected works of Elizabeth Bishop for the Library of America. And he edited the Centennial edition of Elizabeth Bishop's prose. He's the recipient, recipient of a Pulitzer Prize, a Guggenheim Fellowship for Poetry. One of the things that makes this program so special for me, and we've been talking about this for a couple of years, is that both of our panelists actually knew Elizabeth Bishop. So that's this is a rare occasion. And I did want to point out, um, before I forget, that all the books I mentioned are carried by Porter Square Books in Cambridge. So feel free to avail yourself of their services. And I also want to say that 
um, I've been doing programs for three decades with authors, and Lloyd has been doing programs with me since 1993. So, Lloyd, I want to thank you for all the memories. And thank you. We'll turn it over to our panelists. All right. Um, I think I'm up first here. Uh, we're going to alternate reading poems and and uh, I'll read a little bit, some portions from my book and uh, have some memories and observations. And I really want to thank Steve Weiner so much for organizing this. And I don't know how many of you know, this is the last program he's going to run at the library before going into a deserved uh, retirement. So we want to toast Steve and um, make this a happy night for him. Um, thank you. Also really glad to be here with Lloyd, as I'll tell you, I would never have written this biography of Elizabeth Bishop without his blessing. And that was one of the first things I, I sought when I began to think about writing the book, which I'll talk about later, but um, I'm very grateful to Lloyd. And I um, also want to say that um, it's been a long time since anyone introduced me by mentioning my very first book, The Cost of Loving, which came out in 1984. But I really wouldn't have written the book I did, if not for that book, because um, a classmate of mine from Elizabeth Bishop's class, Millie Nash, who may be listening here, um, happened to pick that up in a library book sale about around the time I was starting the Elizabeth Bishop book and found that book and said, could that be Megan who was in my class? And she wrote to me and um, turned out Millie Nash had a trove of notes and papers and memories that helped me pull together uh, some of the really most important parts of the book towards the end. So thank you, um, Steve, for mentioning that book, which uh, otherwise I tend to uh, not mention. <laughs> but it, it helped me in the long run. So uh, we're going to start by each of us reading the first poem that we knew of Elizabeth Bishop's. Um, and in my case, that was the poem that's called Simply Poem. Uh, many of you know that there are a few of Bishop's poems that are titled by a form, um, sestina or sonnet um, poem, I guess could be anything, but uh, this is a poem that she wrote about a small painting that had belonged in the family, um, came down to her. And because I was later, you know, not this was not at all when I first heard the poem, uh, I didn't know anything about the painting itself, but when researching the book, I was also able to see the painting itself, which belongs to someone who might possibly be listening tonight as well, although I won't name her. Um, but it was such a wonderful thing to see the poem. You'll hear though that the painting, I mean, to see the painting, the painting is so well described in the poem, in the poem that, that uh, you don't need to see it. I don't need to show it to you. Um, I was lucky to, find my way into Robert Lowell's uh, writing workshop, poetry workshop in the spring of 1975. And um, I had only just begun writing poetry as a semi-adult, age 20. And um, I don't really know how I got there. I wasn't even a fully enrolled Harvard student, um, but uh, I was a dropout from Bennington trying to make up some credits and I applied to enter this class. Um, and um, along with a few other classes, I was signed up for as a special student. And some of us who were special students in Robert Lowell's class thought that maybe he thought that meant we were special. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anyway, there were a few other special students and graduate students and undergraduate students. Um, and uh, about halfway through the semester, he, he occasionally would have guests come, not always poets. His daughter was there, um, Caroline, his wife Caroline was there one time, or maybe they came together. Um, and Frank Bedard almost always was there and sometimes would fill in for Robert Lowell when he wasn't able to come. But one day, Elizabeth Bishop came to class and she had a black binder of, of poems that she was going to read from. Um, initially, I think she was just planned to read one poem and the first one she read was poem, which uh, had then been published in the New Yorker, but her uh, book Geography 3, in which it appeared, had not come out yet. This is 1975. And um, to a couple of things about the poem. Um, first of all, when I heard it, I had the very same thought that I later found that she had when she heard, first read Marianne Moore's poems, 
Uh, she said, I hadn't known poetry could be like that. Why had no one ever written about things in this clear and dazzling way before? So she had that effect on me. It didn't turn me into Elizabeth Bishop the way Marianne Moore's poems turned Elizabeth Bishop into Elizabeth Bishop, but still. Um, and I was so also struck all the professors I had had for so much of the time were men. And here was a woman who was writing poetry, who was so admired by our professor, Robert Lowell. Um, in the course of doing my research for the book, I found that very early in life, Elizabeth Bishop had said her aim in writing a poem was to capture the sense of the mind in the act of thinking, the mind in the act of thinking. And I think she very much did that in this poem, which uh, I will read to you. There's one portion of it that's in italics where she's kind of reporting a conversation with, um, with a, a relative, an older relative who's passing down this painting to her. So poem. About the size of an old style dollar bill, American or Canadian, mostly the same whites, gray greens and steel grays, this little painting, a sketch for a larger one, has never earned any money in its life. Useless and free, it has spent 70 years as a minor family relic handed along collaterally to owners who looked at it sometimes or didn't bother to. It must be Nova Scotia. Only there does one see gabled wooden houses painted that awful shade of brown. The other houses, the bits that show are white. Elm trees, low hills, a thin church steeple, that gray blue wisp, or is it? In the foreground, a water meadow with some tiny cows, two brush strokes each, but confidently cows. Two minuscule white geese in the blue water, back to back feeding, and a slanting stick. Up closer, a wild iris, white and yellow, fresh squiggled from the tube. The air is fresh and cold, cold early spring, clear as gray glass. A half inch of blue sky below the steel gray storm clouds. They were the artist's specialty. A speck like bird is flying to the left, or is it a fly speck looking like a bird? Heavens, I recognize the place, I know it. It's behind, I can almost remember the farmer's name. His barn backed on that meadow, there it is. Titanium white, one dab. The hint of steeple, filaments of brush hairs ba barely there, must be the Presbyterian church. Would that be Miss Gillespie's house? Those particular geese and cows are naturally before my time. A sketch done in an hour, in one breath, once taken from a trunk and handed over. Would you like this? I'll probably never have room to hang those these things again. Your Uncle George, no, mine, my Uncle George, he'd be your great uncle, left them all with mother when he went back to England. You know, he was quite famous, an RA, that's Royal Academy in England. I never knew him. We both knew this place. Apparently, this literal small backwater looked at it long enough to memorize it our years apart. How strange. And it's still loved, or its memory is. It must have changed a lot. Our visions coincided. Visions is too serious a word. Our looks, two looks, art copying from life and life itself. Life and the memory of it so compressed, they've turned into each other. Which is which? Life and the memory of it, cramped dim on a piece of Bristol board, dim, but how live, how touching in detail. The little that we get for free, the little of our earthly trust, not much. About the size of our abidance, along with theirs, the munching cows, the iris, crisp and shivering, the water still standing from spring freshets, the yet to be dismantled elms, the geese. I'm gonna try to turn off my email so you don't hear little notifications binging if those are mine. Um, and I also, but I just, before Lloyd reads, I wanna 
tell you, um, going through my notes, I came across this wonderful description by Howard Moss, who was for many years Elizabeth's um, editor at The New Yorker, of um, his response to her book of poems, North and South. He says, it's as if you could wrap joy in mystery and somehow make it the subject of small talk. I think that <laughs> describes poem a bit. Anyway, I'm, I'm gonna be moving back and forth so I can fix my email, but listen to Lloyd, don't let me distract you. Um, I love that poem. That's really one of my most favorite of all of Elizabeth Bishop's poems. Uh, and I will, um, I'll tell you the story of my, not only the first time I ever heard a poem by Elizabeth Bishop, it was the first time I ever heard of her at all. I had a great teacher when I was an undergraduate, Mary Doyle Curran at Queens College. And I was in her um, modern literature. No, I was in her sophomore survey course of English literature. And, um, you know, she had a syllabus to, to teach of, you know, great English and American literature, poetry, and other things. Um, but she wasn't allowed to teach contemporary poetry. But we, her students really loved her. She lived in Greenwich Village and we would follow her home on the subway. She was like the Pied Piper. Uh, we would follow her home on the subway and go to her apartment. Her, she had a studio apartment right near Washington Square and she would sit down in a big comfortable chair and we would sit on the floor and she would read us poems by contemporary writers that she, sh she thought we should know about. So Robert Lowell, Richard Wilbur, James Wright, and one of them was Elizabeth Bishop. Who, who is that? And she read us this poem that I, you know, literally floored me because I was sitting on the floor uh, at, at her feet and hearing this amazing poem that I can't, I can't say at all that I, that I understood at the time, although I've thought about it a, a great deal um, since then. And um, it's called uh, The Man Moth. And there's a little asterisk next to the title. It's her, it's Elizabeth Bishop's asterisk. And, the, and it says, newspaper misprint for mammoth. So there was an ad in a paper and they spelled mammoth, M-A-N-M-O-T-H. Um, she, she said at, so, at some point somewhere, I think she's quoted as saying it was her poem about New York, but I really think, I really think it's a poem about being an artist and the way an artist either does or doesn't fit in with the, with the world uh, around, around him or her. The Man Moth. Here above, cracks in the buildings are filled with battered moonlight. The whole shadow of man is only as big as his hat. It lies at his feet like a circle for a doll to stand on. And he makes an inverted pin, the point magnetized to the moon. He does not see the moon. He observes only her vast properties, feeling the queer light on his hands, neither warm nor cold, of a temperature impossible to record in thermometers. But when the man moth pays his rare, though occasional visits to the surface, the moon looks rather different to him. He emerges from an opening under the edge of one of the sidewalks and nervously begins to scale the faces of the buildings. He thinks the moon is a small hole at the top of the sky, proving the sky quite useless for protection. He trembles, but must investigate 
as high as he can climb. Up the facades, his shadow dragging like a photographer's cloth behind him. He climbs fearfully, thinking that this time he will manage to push his small head through that round, clean opening and be forced through as from a tube in black scrolls on the light. Man standing below him has no such illusions. But what the man moth fears most, he must do. Although he fails, of course, and falls back, scared, but quite unhurt. Then he returns to the pale subways of cement he calls his home. He flits, he flutters, and cannot get aboard the silent trains fast enough to suit him. The doors close swiftly. The man moth always seats himself facing the wrong way. And the train starts at once at its full, terrible speed without a shift in gears or a gradation of any sort. He cannot tell the rate at which he travels backwards. Each night, he must be carried through artificial tunnels and dream recurrent dreams, just as the ties recur beneath his train. These underlie his rushing brain. He does not dare to look out the window for the third rail, the unbroken draft of poison runs there beside him. He regards it as a disease he has inherited the susceptibility to. He has to keep his hands in his pockets as others wear mufflers. If you catch him, hold up a flashlight to his eye. It's all dark pupil, an entire night itself, whose haired horizon tightens as he stares back and closes up the eye. Then from the lids, one tear, his only possession, like the bee's sting, slips. Slyly, he palms it. And if you're not paying attention, he'll swallow it. However, if you watch, he'll hand it over, cool as from underground springs and pure enough to drink. Mm. Perfect, Lloyd. Mm. I was just thinking of uh, what has become a kind of um, famous phrase that Elizabeth Bishop never published uh, it was part of a, a of a of a draft of an essay about poetry that she was that she was writing and she talks about uh, she says how the poems she loved most share the qualities of accuracy spontaneity and mystery and I think those three adjectives are just wonderful descriptions of her own work. Mm. What a great reading. Thanks, Lloyd. I think oh, thank I'm, you. I'm also wondering if that poem appealed to you because of its, it's, it's a sort of city New York scene that is not all that much in many of her poems. Um, but I, I can imagine that, you know, one a, a New York kid like you might have also been drawn to that. Well, I love the subway. Voyage, yeah. I yeah. love the subway. When I was when I was little, I would stand in the first car and look out the window so I could see the tunnel in, uh, ahead of me. I noticed there was what was squeezed from the tube that we had. We had the oh yeah, uh, we have two tubes fresh and, wiggled and, from the tube, the, the I, white iris. So and yeah, and this was the 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 the, the image of the sky. Ah um, uh, yeah. Um, and think how many years apart that was. Forty years apart. The, the right, the isn't it? I know. I was really struck by that. Years, yeah. yeah. I, uh, mm -hmm. I don't. I don't think I ever. 
thought of these these two poems together at this right. at, at the same time. Um, yeah. So I, I was going to talk a little bit um, while well, we were going to, uh, Lloyd was going to ask me, what made you think of writing a biography? Well, I, I was going to, I was just about to. Oh, ask. okay. Sorry. I'm leaping in. No, go ahead. Okay. So, you know, what made you think of writing a biography of Elizabeth Bishop, which seems very um, bold and ambitious even now thinking about it, having done it. But um, I, I often get into book writing by thinking it's going to be something easier than I planned. So in this case, um, you know, I've always wanted to write a, a short biography that you could read in, you know, maybe one sitting, like a short novel. And actually, my biography of Margaret Fuller started that way. There had been a two-volume, wonderful, you know, authoritative biography of Margaret Fuller that came out in uh, early 2000s. I had just finished my Peabody Sisters book, which took me 20 years. So you can imagine I was looking for something that would be, you know, a relief from that. And so I thought, well, Margaret Fuller, she's written, lived only 40 years. I could certainly do that with that rather dramatic life and uh, started in, I think, around 2007, hoping to get it done, a little book you'd hold in your hand by 2010, which was her bicentennial. And there just was too much to say, you know, it took longer and uh, came out in 2013. And after that came out though, um, someone many of us here know, uh, Jim Atlas, the late wonderful biographer of Delmore Schwartz and Saul Bellow and a brilliant editor of Brief Lives um, wrote to me and said he was starting up a new line of sh Brief Lives, would I, would I contribute? And I thought, ah, oh, that's, that's a great idea, my chance. Um, and I had had I was so engaged in the writing of the last chapters of Margaret Fuller um, uh, that I just wanted to keep, I wanted to keep writing. I thought if I had I got a contract for a book that was due very soon as this short one was, maybe I could get out of teaching for a semester. Even if it was unpaid, I could say, I have this deadline, I must do this, you know, professional leave, um, which I did. And as I said, I asked Lloyd's Blessing and uh, Gail Mazers also, Bishop fans and friends and in this uh, Boston area, um, they said, go ahead with this. Um, and I, uh, you know, I thought she'd published only a hundred poems in her lifetime and I had been her student. I would write something along the lines of a kind of appreciation, not really a full biography, but you know, no sooner had I signed the contract to write a book that was due in a year's time, um, then I learned that there was new material in the Bishop archive. Um, there were letters that she'd written and back and a long correspondence with Alice, her uh, late life partner. Um, there were uh, letters she'd written to a lot of Jimiseto Suarez who were, that were, um, you know, quite revealing about the last years of their marriage, might as well call it that, and, um, and uh, several quite long and detailed letters she'd written to her um, psychoanalyst in the 1940s when she was in her 30s, I guess, um, also very revealing. And so I quickly arranged to go read these. And I have to say, I was initially quite disturbed by what I was finding in them. I was still thinking of Elizabeth Bishop as Miss Bishop, my teacher. Um, and then here she's revealing a great deal about herself. Um, I won't go into that right now. Um, I didn't, I felt that the love letters that was fine, but the letters to the psychoanalyst, I was quite concerned about and even thought of contacting um, Jonathan Galassi, who is part of FSG controlling the rights to these letters and saying that this, this can't be, you, you can't, these can't go out there. Um, but I realized they were already being read by others. And I, I, I came to the conclusion that perhaps because I knew her a little bit um, and uh, that I would try very hard to be the first to write about some of the issues in these letters and, and try to do it in a way that was respectful. Um, uh, part of my research was, um, I came across in my research, I'll say, uh, uh, a wonderful introduction that Mae Swenson had given in 1977 
uh, before Elizabeth B Bishop read at the 92nd Street Y. And one of the things May Swenson said, this was meant to be very approving. Elizabeth Bishop, she is not known to the public for anything but her work. Um, and that was at the very end of Bishop's life. Soon that changed after she died with the publication of her letters. And, uh, and I think in a, a large sense, the biography became a, a, a vehicle for more people learning about and knowing and loving her work. But uh, this was on again from there. So the, you know, the book got bigger pretty quickly. I, for, for a while, I was still trying to write this short book very fast. And you'll probably think this is funny in, in March of 20. 14, um, I, I was just starting to write. Um, I had had to take some, this was my semester off to write the book. Um, and I was starting to write maybe 10 pages, 15 pages. And uh, four o'clock one afternoon, actually, I guess it was just in April by then. In March, I'd been having to promote the paperback of Margaret Fuller. How annoying, you know, taking me from my writing to, and uh, April, I got this call from my editor. She says, Megan, you won the Pulitzer Prize. And first I thought, oh, she's kidding. And then I thought, damn, I'm gonna miss my deadline. <laughs> you know, I don't wanna stop writing. But of course I came to be happy about that news in the next second and, and it did slow me down, but it did, the slowing down gave me the chance to realize this was gonna be a bigger book, which I then also um, wrote much more quickly than I had written any of my other biographies because I still had a near deadline, but I still wanted to have this be a somewhat personal book. Um, and I included a, a memoirish sort of subplot that, um, some of you who've read the book will know about that. So that's how I got into it, sort of backwards, but it came, became for me a, a real, um, I don't know, pulling together of my work as a biographer and my ambitions, my early ambitions as a poet, um, reconciling a lot of that. And, and for me, it's the book I feel most close to at this point that I've written. So Lloyd, the question is, You've spent so much time studying Bishop and you wrote a dissertation about Bishop and I'm sure you've been asked to write biographies of Elizabeth Bishop, but you haven't, you know, yeah. or even a memoir. <laughs> what, what, how do you explain that? Yeah, well, I am still um, uh, trying to figure that out for myself. <laughs> and- um, You could I, still. I feel, you know, yeah, I don't think so though. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I was so lucky to know her and um, we can, oh, I can, I can even, I mean, I can actually reproduce in its entirety, which will take about 10 seconds, uh, our very first meeting um, when she came to Harvard to teach at Harvard in 1970. And I went to the first reading that she gave and Frank Bedart was there and Frank knew her um, and after the reading uh, he brought her over to me and said Elizabeth I'd like you to meet my friend Lloyd Schwartz and I said to her and I can I'm sure I am quoting quite accurately uh, oh Miss Bishop I'm so happy to meet you I loved your reading. I have always admired her. I have always admired your work. To which she replied, and I quote, oh, thank you. And then she walked away. <laughs> and that's how we, that's how we met. And then gradually we, we got to see each other at other readings or at other social events. She was very, protective of her of her privacy uh, and it took a while um, before we you know got got to have a, a real friendship um, I think that part started when at, I'm at some place where, where we were in a, at some gathering um, I asked her if I could take her to lunch and to my shock, she, she said yes. And we had 
uh, we had lunch together and I, I, I don't really remember anything about that conversation except one detail, which in some way just made a huge difference in my life. Not certainly not in hers, but um, she was lamenting the fact that she was going to be left in Cambridge all by herself over the Christmas break. So this was this was late 1973. And I said something about, oh, you know, I'm going to be here by myself, too. And she said, oh, maybe we can get together or something like that. Just some trivial thing that just went by. And then it must have been a little over a month later. I got a telephone call. And it was from Elizabeth Bishop, whom I had never spoken to on the phone before. Um, and she was in trouble. She had fallen and broken her shoulder and she was in the infirmary at Harvard. And she said, I hate to bother you. And she repeated that over and over again. I'm so sorry to bother you, but I don't know anyone else who is around. And could you come to my room at the infirmary at, at, at Harvard and get my keys and go to my apartment, which was like three blocks away and get my mail and bring me some things from my apartment. And I said, well, of course, sure, I will do that. And she apologized six or seven more times uh, for bothering me, for troubling me. And uh, I thought, well, I, I, I can actually be helpful to Elizabeth Bishop. I could do something for her. And I went to the infirmary, which wasn't very far away. And I got her keys and I went to her apartment, which was even less far away. And I brought her her things, her mail and her she had a large purse that she that she wanted me to bring and some other things. And I ended up spending the whole day with her in her hospital room. The one thing, really the, the major thing that we, we were never able to talk about because she didn't want to talk about it, about it was her poetry. And it was the only thing for some years that we had in common. But by this time, we had a lot of people in common. So we gossiped. We talked about people we knew, and we talked about music that we liked, and we talked about movies that we had seen. And I spent the whole day with, with her in her hospital room. And I came back every day for the next few days. You know, getting her, I kept her key. Uh, her mailbox key, and I kept bringing her, you know, bringing her mail every day. And then I would just spend the rest of the day gabbing with her in, you know, in, in her hospital room. And um, that's really, that's kind of how we became friends, because we suddenly we had kind of personal things uh, to talk about. And, um, I I, um, I I am so grateful for that uh, for that friendship. Um, uh, at a at a certain point, uh, a few years a couple of years later, uh, I was dealing with the question of uh, Megan. You mentioned my dissertation. Well, my my original dissertation was not on Elizabeth Bishop. And I was kind of, um, uh, I was assigned an advisor uh, who didn't see eye to eye with me about my original topic. And uh, seven years went by and I had written one chapter of a dissertation and I thought it was just dead in the water. And it looked like my school was, I was teaching at Boston State College and looked like the school was going to be shut down. It was. 
Um, and I thought, well, this is the mid seventies, teaching jobs were not available. And I think I'm gonna have to give up teaching, but boy, if I give up teaching, I wanna, ha I wanna, give, I wanna be a taxi driver or a waiter with a PhD. I really wanted to finish a dissertation. And it occurred to me that the only person I really wanted to write about was Elizabeth Bishop. And I had the feeling that she would, if I asked her if it was okay for me to write about her, that she would say no. That, you know, it, it was somehow invading her privacy or her territory. And, I, you know, I mean, this is a long roundabout answer to, to Megan's question about why I don't want to write a, I don't particularly want to write a biography of Elizabeth Bishop or, or even a memoir, though I, I have written things about her. Um, but to my great surprise, uh, she said, she had two responses to my request about, I mean, she would, you know, just just to, to get permission from her to write my thesis on her. And her first answer was, oh, but there isn't very much to write about. And I said, well, why don't you let me be the judge of that? <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I think there's plenty to write about. And then the second thing she said was, but would you finish it? because here I was seven years into a dissertation that I hadn't finished. And I said, well, you know, if I'm writing about you, I, I, I think I would finish it. And my, my great regret is that I finished it too soon because she actually offered to meet with me so that we could just talk about her poems. There would be an hour set aside every week or every other week in which I could meet with her and just ask her questions about, about her poetry and that she would answer to the best of, of, of her ability, which was very, uh, which, which was just wonderful. And, and, and boy, I, 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 I didn't want that to come to an end because once it came to an end, I could never talk to her about her poetry anymore. Lloyd, would you want to say, is there one particular thing that was startling in those conversations? Do you remember them now? Uh, yeah, I, I do. Um, uh, one thing that we couldn't talk about was interpretation. Oh. And she was happy to give me all sorts of interesting details about who poems were about and how they happened to be written and where they were published and how hard they were to write and so on. But if I, I remember once, and it only took once, just asking her about a line in one of her poems that I just I didn't understand and in some way still don't understand. Uh, and there was something about the syntax of that line that I, I, I just found hard to follow. And her answer was, but it's obvious. You know, that reminds me that when she, when she came to teach uh, at Harvard, taking over, substituting for Robert Lowell, who taught a workshop and a literature class, Lowell's class was called something like Forms of Contemporary Poetry. Um, and she said, well, I'll teach a literature class, but I can't teach, I don't know, from forms in contemporary poetry. She said she was going to teach subject matter in contemporary poetry. Huh. Like that. So she was comfortable talking about what people wrote about and maybe comparing the different ways they did. But that sort of speaks to what she's willing. She could talk about the subject matter to some extent, I guess. Yeah, but she didn't want to talk about that vis-a-vis -vis her own poems. Yeah, that was just that was just off limits. So where are we in our plan? Um, wow. uh, do you want? I was going to. Oh, oh, I well, I yeah, we could talk keep about going. going to your poem. We could, we could talk poem. about um, a poem that I discovered. 
-hmm. That's where uh, we're at, I think. And, and I, oh, I want to say, because uh, one of the really important books uh, of, of and about Elizabeth Bishop is Alice Quinn's um, volume, uh, Edgar Allan Poe and the Jukebox, which is a collection of, this was a revelation that it was a collection of Bishop's unfinished and unpublished poems. As Megan said before, she had published a hundred poems in her entire life, in her entire lifetime. And suddenly there were all these other poems by Elizabeth Bishop, some of them really very close to being finished, some of them only loose drafts. But suddenly here was this whole book of, uh, of work by Elizabeth Bishop. And Alice, if you don't know her, was the uh, a poetry editor at Knopf and she was the poetry editor of the New Yorker. And, um, and we, everyone who loves Elizabeth Bishop owes Alice a huge debt of gratitude. And she is here tonight. I can actually see her right now. And so thank you, Alice. Um, well, I will tell you one more story about visiting Elizabeth Bishop in the infirmary. And this had to do, she had fallen. Uh, she had fallen down a flight of steps at a local pub in Harvard Square called the Casablanca. And at one point in one of the days that I was visiting her, uh, she was taken out of the room um, to, I, 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 as I, I don't even know what for, but probably just to get an x-ray. And I was uh, alone in Elizabeth Bishop's hospital room uh, with nothing to read. And then one of the things that I had brought her from her apartment was a little notebook. And I mean, I was alone in a room with Elizabeth Bishop's notebook and I opened it. And there on the top page was a short poem, a love poem, and which I read and I thought, I just, I've never seen anything quite like this by Elizabeth Bishop, although no one else could have written it. And I was, I was moved and I had kind of, it was love at first sight. I fell in love with this poem. And I was also, I had the thought that I might never see this poem again because she had never really published anything quite like it. And that she was perfectly capable of not publishing it and she was also capable of destroying it. And I copied it. I took a piece of paper and I just copied the poem with all the little corrections that she, that she made. And I kept it to myself uh, for about 20 years. And it never, it was never published. And once all this new material had turned up at, at Vassar, all these, uh, all her papers and her drafts and so on. And there was one, there was one draft which had the opening two lines of this poem, but that was all. And as far as, I, as, far as we know, and there are people watching tonight, here tonight, uh, who can verify this, that, that this, the complete poem has, has, has never been found. And that as far as we know, I had the only copy of it. And finally, uh, and again, this is after she died, years after she died. 
And there was Robert Giroux of Farrar, Strauss and Giroux was thinking about doing a new edition of, uh, of Elizabeth Bishop's poetry. And I thought, well, I think this is the time that I have to, I have to send him a copy of that draft uh, of that poem. And he um, loved it and he sent it to Alice Quinn and Alice published it in the New Yorker and, and then included it in, in Edgar Allan Poe in the jukebox. And I, this is a poem I really, I just dearly love. And, um, and I would love to read it to you. Uh, it's called Breakfast Song. My love, my saving grace, your eyes are awfully blue. I kiss your funny face, your coffee-flavored mouth. Last night, I slept with you. Today, I love you so, how can I bear to go as soon I must, I know, to bed with ugly death in that cold, filthy place to sleep there without you, without the easy breath and night-long, limb-long warmth I've grown accustomed to. Nobody wants to die. Tell me it is a lie. But no, I know it's true. It's just the common case. There's nothing one can do. My love, my saving grace, your eyes are awfully blue, early and instant blue. Well, sometimes when I talk about my book and read from my book, I read the passage I'm gonna read now and then I end by reading that poem that Lloyd discovered and Alice published in her volume um, uh, because this is a section that tells about how um, Alice and Elizabeth met and how they fell in love. And uh, so it's- Alice, built, Alice Meth Vessel. Uh, sorry, Alice, Alice Meth Vessel, but to whom this poem was written, I'm sorry. Exactly. I'll introduce her in this section. Um, okay. And um, it also, I, I read it also partly to demonstrate the way the structure of my book works. The book is called A Miracle for Breakfast, which is, or that's the, the Elizabeth Bishop, the subtitle, A Miracle for Breakfast, which is the title of her, the first of two Sestinas that she wrote. She wrote it in uh, uh, the 1930s. Um, as I was looking for a title for my book, I wanted something that would capture the spirit of, I think what she sometimes said was her favorite line from one of her poems. Um, awful but cheerful. All the untidy activity continues awful but cheerful at the end of the bite. Um, so there, there are dark sides of Elizabeth Bishop's life and um, uh, a lot of unhappy news to report writing the biography, but she clung to the cheerful as well. And I felt a miracle for breakfast captured that title. And then I had this sort of brainstorm that I could use. Uh, many of you know the structure of a sestina of six, uh, six stanza lines and the ending words, the end words of each line in the first stanza are repeated in a particular pattern going forward. Um, and so this, the ending end words of A Miracle for Breakfast are um, uh, balcony, crumb, coffee, miracle, uh, river, miracle, and sun. And um, I felt that I could use these, you know, sort of to clue readers to what the theme of that uh, a biographical chapter about Elizabeth Bishop was um, a little bit, and it would be a little bit like Pee Wee's Playhouse, you know, where there'd be the secret word and you go through the episode and, and then the word comes, ah, you know, crumb, balcony, ah, ding, ding, ding. But anyway, um, so this is the last chapter and it's called Sun and I'm going to read a, a portion of it about Alice and Elizabeth falling in love in 1970 and 1971 when Elizabeth has come to take over Robert Lowell's job um, and it is called Sun and I think you'll see why. The poor heart 
doesn't seem to grow old at all, Elizabeth had written to Alice Methfessel from Uro Preto in March 1971, a month after her 60th birthday and two weeks past Alice's 28th. But their age difference was nearly always on her mind from the moment Alice first laid her head on Elizabeth's shoulder when Alice had stopped in to see her after a beery party with the boys of Kirkland House, where Elizabeth was living in an apartment reserved for visiting scholars during the fall of 1970 and stayed and stayed like a child who couldn't bear to go to bed. Alice Methfessel was the otherwise entirely sensible, slim and athletic Kirkland House secretary with blue, blue, blue eyes and a disposition as bright as the sunny side up formula she used to lighten her cropped hair, who had helped move Elizabeth into her second floor rooms in eye entry in early October, showed her how to use the basement washing machines, and soon was handling Elizabeth's mail, meeting her at the airport after a late return from New York City and bringing her home to the fifth floor studio apartment on Chauncey Street, where Alice lived just outside Harvard Square. Alice's apartment was the most electrified place Elizabeth had ever seen. Hi-fi, radios, two, color TV, hair dryers, two, electric blanket, electric clock, electric water pick for toothbrushing, along with an electric stove and refrigerator, just normal here in contrast to Brazil where Elizabeth had been living for the last almost 20 years. In contrast to Brazil, Elizabeth supposed as she watched Alice dress for work in the morning from the large blue bed that took up more space than anything else in the room. She'd loved the lock of hair that Alice allowed Elizabeth to smooth back from her forehead and those nice satiny eyelids shut tight as Alice slept. She loved the coffee Alice brought to her now in bed and looking out the window to see nothing but bare branches when Alice drew back the curtains and the sound of Alice's voice, nice and loud and cheerful as she spoke the words that became their waking up ritual. Good morning, I love you. Elizabeth adored the way you put on your stockings in the morning, very American, careless and extravagant. And she'd never forget the sight of Alice wrapping her beautiful neck with a bright red scarf against the cold. Later that fall and winter, they would plan ahead for more indulgent breakfasts of croissant from Ceci Bon and foamy cappuccinos that Elizabeth taught Alice to make with Medaglia Doro coffee. That was the height of uh, exclusive coffee at the time. When they parted at the end of Elizabeth's first Harvard semester in February 1971, following a magical weekend at New York's posh Hotel Elysee, both were in tears, neither sure that the other's love could last through the seven months before Elizabeth returned to teach again in September. Alice, who was used to chatting up Harvard professors and assorted dignitaries passing through Kirkland House had still been taken aback at your loving little me. Alice was tall, Elizabeth was the little one, but she was so much older and a famous poet. For her part, Elizabeth knew, I'm wrong in every way except as a dear older friend, she wrote to Alice from Uro Preto, and that you are much too young for me, have many, many things you must do. Surely Alice's admirable practicality would cause her to break things off, to do what's right for you, and I, I'll know it's right for you, but I dread it terribly at the same time. Troubled by the bows in Alice's past and having witnessed the attraction Alice held for Kirkland House boys and even the avuncular housemaster, Professor Arthur Smithies, he'd given Alice a book called Nymphos and Other Maniacs for her birthday. <laughs> Elizabeth wooed Alice as best she could in letters she feared were indiscreet and asked her to please destroy after a while, although she didn't. She conjured a scene, Alice arriving home from work where all your electrical gadgets will be waiting for you and they will turn themselves on and begin throbbing and singing, Alice, we love you, we love you, we love you. Please let us warm your little body and dry your hair and make ice for your bourbon. But Elizabeth didn't really have to try so hard. Her sensible lover would not be shaken off course, despite the occasional dinner with Bob the Boring or the sighting of a former beau, Toby. She signed her letters for always, Alice. Elizabeth sent Alice love, housefuls, churchfuls, airports full. 
slept with Alice's letters, carried her photo buttoned into her shirt pocket. Alice lay in bed at night watching slides of Elizabeth she'd taken on late fall excursions projected on the white wall of her studio apartment. Still, Elizabeth worried, dreamed they met by chance in a foreign airport, but had only three hours together before catching separate planes. She began taking a nightly Nembutal to sleep, then in Uro Preto, where bottles of cachaça and Old Crow were plentiful, and having the best breakfast for hundreds of miles around, her own cornbread, toasted, plum jam she'd made from fruit in the garden, was no fun at all alone. Elizabeth had two collapses, one on top of the other, binged twice in quick succession, she admitted, after failing to write for more than two weeks, frightening Alice. Elizabeth could not stop envisioning a dreadful end to their pleasure and the saving grace of Alice's love. It was now Elizabeth learned she could tell Alice anything, and Alice, less neurotic than anyone else Elizabeth knew, would remain unfazed, continue to love Elizabeth unreservedly, and unlike Elizabeth, who was morbidly given to borrowing trouble and expecting the worst, confine her own worries to things I can actively do something about. That was Alice, grateful to know the much older Elizabeth, or I'd be really hung up on the generation gap. Literary enough to quote Wordsworth, the child is father of the man, but taking the adage to define the child's responsibility for his parents. Uh, the, um, and uh, sorry, the aged, as she called hers, the senior meth vessels were Elizabeth's age, but conservative Pennsylvania country club Republicans with whom Alice had nothing in common but our mutual past and declining Alice thought into a nattering senescence. Both Elizabeth and Alice agreed that despite the vast difference in our ages, they shared a sense of humor, a yen for travel. Alice had already proposed a trip to Brazil for the August of 1971. Stuff can be heavy, so any questions here around this stuff? Sorry, um, somebody's up. To relieve Al Elizabeth's exile and a circumspection about romance that was increasingly rare as the 1970s gave birth to women's lib and before long radical lesbian separatism, they had the same way of looking at things. So when Elizabeth confided that her two collapses had come as she sank once again into just plain grief after so many sad deaths in the past few years, so much insanity, so many God awful experiences and so much time lost forever, fearing above all that her new unsuitable love was only likely to bring more grief and loss. She was testing Alice, even as Elizabeth insisted she didn't mean to burden the younger woman. This awful tailspin was not your fault. How would Alice respond when Elizabeth foretold the worst, a day probably soon when I'll have to see you going off with someone more suitable and I'll have to somehow turn into just being a good friend? <clears throat> Elizabeth loathed the thought of your coming to call on me in my flat in Boston and bringing me a bunch of flowers or something, or you're feeling you have to be nice to an old lady because she's fond of you and you'll be dying to get away and go skiing or swimming or lovemaking with your young man. I really hope I die first. Of course, Alice aced the exam. When Elizabeth worried that she'd be left sitting on shore holding Alice's terry cloth beach wrap while her young lover swam in the Pacific on the tour of the Galapagos Islands, they'd tacked onto the planned August visit, Alice brushed those worries aside and then made certain they both went swimming on Charles Island nice beach flamingos, and mingled with the blue-footed boobies, sea lions, and albatrosses they'd flown all that way to see together. When Elizabeth returned to Cambridge in September, Alice had a one-room bedroom apartment waiting for her in the Brattle Arms. Many of you know that across from the ART, a solid brick building at 60 Brattle Street, just past Design Research and next door to the Window Shop Bakery its walls freshly painted by Harvard boys Alice had hired, and with Alice's new red, yellow, and blue striped terry cloth bathrobe purchased in the men's department of Lord and Taylor, ready for lounging on Sunday mornings. Writing to Elizabeth that spring about her discovery of the Brattle Street apartment, Alice had crowed, if Elizabeth lived here, I'd be home now, mimicking the twin billboards aimed at harried commuters on Boston's Starrow Drive, advertising luxury rentals, in the new Charles River Park complex. If you lived here, you'd be home now. 
Elizabeth's surprise phone call from Brazil just days before had left Alice in a state of blissful shock. Your wonderful laugh will ring through my dreams. Elizabeth taught a second and then a third fall semester at Harvard in 1972 without a serious collapse, living at the Brattle Arms where she'd installed a ping pong table for exercise that could double as a dining table for the occasional dinner party. Alice stayed with her many, if not most nights. Bravely, Elizabeth accepted an offer to return to the University of Washington for one highly paid quarter in the spring of 1973 to raise money for future travels abroad with Alice. She booked a roomette on the Empire Builder from Chicago to Seattle. Elizabeth had always wanted to see the Rockies rise up from the Great Plains and the new Amtrak's Vista Dome car promised dramatic views. She was traveling alone, but Alice could meet her at the end of term to explore the Olympic Peninsula by rental car. As always, when they were apart, Elizabeth jotted down her every move in letters to Alice, typing her first one on a portable machine she'd settled on the roomette's closed toilet lid, an awkward stretch from her single seat by the window. In Chicago, the line for the Renoir show at the entrance to the Art Institute had been too long, so she'd skipped her planned museum visit and ordered the taxi driver straight on to Union Station, where she sat on a bench in the glorious waiting room modeled after Rome's baths of Caracalla, reading the New York Times and a lurid tale of a sex-obsessed centenarian dowager by Tennessee Williams in the latest issue of Playboy. Sick is the only word for it, or maybe decadent she wrote to Alice. An article on Colorado river trips caught her eye and she urged Alice to consider joining her on one with motorized rafts. A 76 year old woman had managed that or the 12 day road trip, R-O-W-E-D, I could make it probably. With Alice as guide, she'd recently learned to cross country ski. Why not this? But what Elizabeth wanted to tell Alice most of all was about taking off on the first leg of her journey, the flight from Boston to O'Hare the day before. Yesterday, as we whooshed up above the rain and gloom of Boston into the bright blue sunlight above it, Elizabeth wrote, I thought it was exactly what your coming into my life has done for me, Alice. Not that fast maybe, but pretty fast. And the wonderful difference is just the same. So Lloyd, we're, we're steaming through our hours. I'm wondering if maybe we wanna to skip to you reading in the waiting room? Uh, I would love to. Let's go there. Uh, uh, good. Um, uh, this is one of her, um, one of her later poems. It's the first poem in her last book. And uh, I, if, 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 I, if I had to pick my most favorite Elizabeth Bishop poem, this, this, this might be, this might be the one. Um, in the waiting room. So uh, I'm not sure we said that Elizabeth Bishop was born in Worcester. And um, then she, of course, she lived in Brazil for many years, and then she returned to Massachusetts um, in her last uh, nine years. So, so she's about 60 when she writes, when, or when she finishes writing uh, this poem, In the Waiting Room. In Worcester, Massachusetts, I went with Aunt Consuelo to keep her dentist's appointment and sat and waited for her in the dentist's waiting room. It was winter. It got dark early. The waiting room was full of grown up people, arctics and overcoats, lamps and magazines. My aunt was inside what seemed like a long time. And while I waited, I read the National Geographic. I could read and carefully studied the photographs. The inside of a volcano, black and full of ashes. Then it was spilling over in rivulets of fire. 
Osa and Martin Johnson dressed in riding breeches, laced boots and pith helmets. A dead man slung on a pole. Long pig, the caption said. Babies with pointed heads wound round and round with string. Black naked women with necks wound round and round with wire like the necks of light bulbs. Their breasts were horrifying. I read it right straight through. I was too shy to stop. And then I looked at the cover, the yellow margins, the date. Suddenly from inside came an O oh of pain. And Consuelo's voice, not very loud or long. I wasn't at all surprised. Even then I knew she was a foolish, timid woman. I might have been embarrassed, but wasn't. What took me completely by surprise was that it was me, my voice in my mouth. Without thinking at all, I was my foolish aunt. I, we were falling, falling, our eyes glued to the cover of the National Geographic, February 1918. I said to myself, three days and you'll be seven years old. I was saying it to stop the sensation of falling off the round turning world into cold blue black space. But I felt you are an I, you are an Elizabeth, you are one of them. Why should you be one too? I scarcely dared to look to see what it was I was. I gave a sidelong glance. I couldn't look any higher. At shadowy gray knees, trousers and skirts and boots and different pairs of hands lying under the lamps. I knew that nothing stranger had ever happened that nothing stranger could ever happen. Why should I be my aunt or me or anyone? What similarities, boots, hands, the family voice I felt in my throat, or even the National Geographic and those awful hanging breasts held us all together or made us all just one? How I didn't know any word for it. How unlikely. How had I come to be here like them and overhear a cry of pain that could have got loud and worse, but hadn't? The waiting room was bright and too hot. It was sliding beneath a big black wave, another and another. Then I was back in it. The war was on. Outside in Worcester, Massachusetts, were night and slush and cold. And it was still the 5th of February, 1918. It just, it just occurred to me that two days ago would have been was Elizabeth Bishop's 110th birthday, mm -hmm. hmm. February 8th. Wow, an epic poem, a confessional, almost confessional poem. It's a, it's everything, and one of was one of my favorites early on, as well, and still is. I, I'm going to read. Um, uh, Lloyd talked about how he got to know Miss Bishop, and I, I didn't know her at all as well as Lloyd, but I, I did take a class with her um, about a year after that time that I'd met her in Robert Lowell's class uh, or heard her read. Um, and she began the class by saying, um, you know, it's a class you had to apply to get into. Everyone felt 
very privileged to be in this class, but um, she began by saying she didn't believe that poetry could be taught. Um, and I think some people were distressed by that, but I, I took it as a kind of challenge that to live up to. Um, maybe, you know, she said, we're going we're gonna to meet here, we're going to discuss poems. I just don't know if it can be taught. And I, I tried my best to somehow learn and practice. Um, we didn't, we had a difficult, I don't know, I had a run in with her later in the semester and I write about that in the book. Um, but uh, she invited the class to a party at the end of the semester and in her apartment. And I am certain that if I hadn't gone to her apartment and seen a very different Elizabeth Bishop, she was quite a, a very self-contained and not a very happy person in the classroom, it seemed, and missed a lot of classes. She was having dental work done. But when we came to the apartment, it was a very different experience. And I think not only would I not have been able to write this book or have some sense of her as a person if I hadn't gone to this party, but I'm not even sure I'd have become a biographer because there was something quite magical about seeing, you know, the intimate life of uh, at least the surface of the intimate life of um, someone who I so revered and um, finding she was a person. Uh, so I'm gonna read this short section about that party. And um, it also happens to be the time I first met Lloyd, although I didn't know it at the time and he's not named in this passage and it will lead into a poem that I'm sure you'll all recognize. Um, I'll do my best to give a good reading. So this is uh, the, the, um, the biographical chapters alternate with the autobiographical ones that are given dates. So this was January 12, 1977 at the end of the semester. And as um, I able, was able to find out reading through her, her notes and journals that uh, this is the first time and the only time it was the last class she taught at Harvard, last workshop in poetry and the, last, the, the first and last time she had a class party, so. Uh, I had come over with a group of friends on the subway to Lewis Wharf in the North End, which was then uh, one of the first um, sort of warehouse buildings that was converted into condos, a whole new concept in 1977. Now, one of us was ringing the bell at a plain oak door down the hall from the fourth floor elevators in the Lewis Wharf condominiums. It had been dark when we left Harvard Square on this winter evening, and darker still when we arrived at Haymarket Station and made our way through a maze of narrow streets, finally crossing broad Atlantic Avenue to the hulking granite structure. Too dark to do more than sense in the damp, brisk breeze, Boston Harbor lapping at the far end of the enormous pier that once sent coastal steamers to Nova Scotia. Elizabeth liked this place because she thought, or in part because she thought that her grandfather would have been, might have docked his ships. He was a sea captain, uh, great-grandfather, sorry, might have uh, docked it at this Lewis Wharf. The door opened on a brilliantly lit scene, or so it seemed compared with the dim hallway. A party was in full swing, people we didn't know, dark-haired, bearded men in v-neck sweaters and corduroys, sipping at drinks. I'd never seen exposed brick walls before, and there were two of them, hung with unfamiliar objects, a gleaming Venetian gilt mirror and a long, brightly painted paddle polished to a high sheen. That paddle comes in and out of the narrative when she acquires it in Brazil and when James Merrill sees it on her wall. And um, so here it is showing up here. Suspended from the ceiling was a horned beast, the figurehead of some Amazonian craft, I guessed, blue-eyed, yellow-haired, open-mawed, a third wall was given over to tightly stuffed bookshelves. Beyond sliding glass doors, I glimpsed a deck and the flickering lights of East Boston across the water. Chairs had been set in a circle and I slipped into one opposite a dark wooden rocker in which our teacher reclined, dressed in slacks, white blouse, thin cashmere sweater, smiling, girlish, pretty among friends. We all took seats. At Miss Bishop's invitation, one of the dark-haired men, Ricardo Sternberg, Brazilian, pulled papers from a briefcase to read several new poems. I listened, unable to take in his words. I could see only Miss Bishop seated next to Ricardo with Frank Bedart on her right. 
so differently warm, yet indifferent to the students she'd invited to her home, perhaps regretting it now? Or had we come as an audience, one she could trust to be admiring? In the weeks since our last class meeting, we knew, her book Geography 3 had been published, and she'd been honored with a double session at the annual Modern Language Association meeting in New York City. She'd read a handful of her own poems, and then, while scholars presented papers on her work, fled the conference center for a meal of corned beef hash with Frank Bedart and her old friends, the duo pianists Gold and Fisdale, at the stage deli across the street. Fortified, she'd returned for the performance of Elliot Carter's A Mirror on Which to Dwell, a setting of six of her poems for chamber ensemble with soprano soloist, which capped off the evening. Now Frank was urging Miss Bishop to read from the new book and she was waving him away. One art, he persisted. At last she took up the slim taupe volume, the book, those white pages in the black binder I'd seen two years before when she'd visited Robert Lowell's class had become and put on her glasses large plastic frames. My God, Elizabeth, these lenses are almost opaque, Frank exclaimed, taking the glasses from her to polish with a handkerchief. Our lore on Harvard's celebrity poets extended to a long ago reading at the Guggenheim in New York, where Robert Lowell had introduced Elizabeth Bishop as the famous I, that's E-Y-E, because of her great powers of observation. Miss Bishop had risen to the podium and tweaked Cal. The famous I will now put on her glasses. She put them on and began to read. A slim younger woman appeared in the hall that led to the kitchen. Blue eyes, dirty blonde hair cropped short. Was that Alice? The woman we'd heard was Miss Bishop's lover? The art of losing isn't hard to master. So many things seem filled with the intent to be lost that their loss is no disaster. Lose something every day, accept the fluster of lost door keys, the hour badly spent. The art of losing isn't hard to master. Then practice losing farther, losing faster, places and names and where it was you meant to travel. None of these will bring disaster. I lost my mother's watch and look, my last or next to last of three loved houses went. The art of losing isn't hard to master. I lost two cities, lovely ones, and vaster. Some realms I owned, two rivers, a continent. I missed them, but it wasn't a disaster. Even losing you, the joking voice, a gesture I love. I shan't have lied. It's evident the art of losing's not too hard to master, though it may look like, write it like disaster. Lloyd, should we take questions? Should we read more I poems? Oh, let's take some questions. But I also want to mention that there is someone in the audience tonight whom you have just referred to. And that is Susan Deveni Weiner. Oh sang the premiere of Elliot Carter's Elizabeth Bishop song cycle. And she was the person that Elizabeth Bishop heard singing mm. at the Americana Hotel at the MLA that, that evening. Mm. And uh, an unforgettable performance. Ah, we should now quote Wallace Absolutely. Stevens and the singer whose song makes whatever it is uh, and the idea of order of Key West. But um, anyway, the singer makes the world. So yes, let's take some questions. Let's take, take some questions. Um, somebody was going to take... Uh, um, yeah, well, uh, well, let's see. Is there anything in the, in the chat box? You, you were invited to to ask questions. You we were invited to ask. There's a question from Linda. Um, who had Elizabeth Bishop lost? Sorry, who had Elizabeth Bishop lost? Well, that's a very uh. good question. Who hadn't she lost, we might say. <laughs> um, 
at that moment that uh, she started writing the poem, and you can see, uh, I think, are there 17 or 18 drafts of the poem um, that are uh, can be found to see how she changed it. She wrote it at a moment uh, when she thought Alice was leaving her, um, Alice Methvessel. And uh, for many of the drafts, it's clearly a kind of cry from the heart, missing and fearing the loss of Alice. Um, but she had always wanted to write uh, an elegy for uh, her beloved Lada. And um, I think over time, this became a poem that was about that loss as well as the loss early of her father when she was eight months old and her mother who was lost to madness in the asylum and died without Elizabeth having seen her for 15 years. Um, and when Elizabeth was in college and you know many other losses along the way, but I would say it's primarily, um, primarily to those two. Um, and, you know, I've had, I, I mentioned this to Lloyd, I, I've memorized that poem along with a few other poems, and I say it to myself often. And one night I was saying it to myself, and instead of saying the art of losing, I said, the art of loving um, in my head. And, um, you know, it's just one letter difference. And I began to think about that then quite popular book by Eric Fromm, The Art of Loving, and, and puzzling over whether she might possibly have been putting a little spin on that too. She had read Eric Fromm, um, we can tell from her letters, although not clearly that particular book. Anyway, that's a good question. Thank you. And um, hope you'll, there's, there's lots been written about it to, to understand that better. I, I always thought, you know, that that poem has become such an iconic poem and, pro and surely her most famous poem now. And it, it's, it's actually been recited in two movies <laughs> and at least two movies, uh, one of which won an Academy Award for 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 Julia and Moore. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe she wouldn't have gotten the Academy Award if she hadn't read one art. Well, one of the things, and, oh, sorry. and that and that and that Elizabeth would have been absolutely astonished, and I think totally delighted that her poems would have been in you know commercial would have been read in commercial movies. Uh, the, 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 I was just going to say also that it took the, the poem, if you look at the drafts, very quickly took the Villanelle form and, and much of it stayed the same, but it was those final lines. Was it a disaster or was it not a disaster? And pretty much, you know, till almost the end, um, it, she was going to admit it was a disaster, but right. um, by the end, it was she was going to ward off that disaster. Anyway. Um, Alice Quinn has a question for Susan Deveni Weiner. And and was wondering if Susan had anything to say about singing Elizabeth Bishop poems. Well, the intensity and complication of the language were marvelous to go after and to be able to use a singing voice to go behind the meaning of the surface saying was something very exciting um, to be a part of. Yeah. I love the way you use the word marvelous, which I think was a favorite word of Elizabeth's comes up oh. in some poems, several poems and a title of a poem. Right. Thanks. Any, any, any other questions? Hi, this is Fran, this is Francine from uh, Worcester, and um, oh hi, hi. <laughs> I know Francine and, from Worcester. I know, and I just wanted actually not so much a question, um, just two comments. First, a a, a comment to Megan. Thank you for writing the Peabody Sisters because I loved it. And uh, a comment about Elizabeth Bishop. We have a, we had, I don't know if it's still going on because I'm in Brooklyn now, um, but we had a, uh, a tradition in Worcester of going to Elizabeth's grave site uh, every February 8th 
regardless of the weather, unusually cold, and reciting some of her poems and always ending with the bite um, and with the famous uh, final couplet that appears on the stone. And um, I don't live in I don't live in Worcester any longer, but I still go outside and read it to sort of the general atmosphere, no matter where I am. Well, I believe um, she wrote that on a birthday, or it's it's for a birthday, isn't it? So it's appropriate. Her birthday. Her birthday. Yeah, yes. on her birthday. I don't remember which year or how old. I, I didn't even know that. That's interesting. But that's just something we used to do. And I think there are one or two people from Worcester that are actually um, here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I, I just wanted to say that her, her poetry has given so many people so much pleasure. And that's obvious with the, the turnout tonight. That's the awful but cheerful. Yes, all, all the untidy uh, activity continues awful but cheerful. I, as I recall, and I could be wrong about this, uh, but there are there is Megan and there is Tom Travisano, another bishop biographer who is in the audience, who had a question. But as I recall, Elizabeth was actually joking to Alice about, I think awful but cheerful should be on my gravestone. Ah. And then when, <laughs> and then her, you know, she was, after she died, there was, um, she was buried in a family plot and there was nothing on her gravestone. And finally, at least a year went by, maybe longer, Alice decided that there should be an inscription. And she remembered Elizabeth joking about awful but cheerful. And then she thought awful but cheerful isn't really the thing you wanna put on a gravestone, but the two lines, all the untidy activity continues awful but cheerful. And, and uh, uh, Angela Dorenkamp and, um, yeah. was one of the people that, uh, that helped make that happen. Right. Um, I, I, re I remember the people in Worcester have been really great about their We folks. love her. <laughs> so so Tom, Tom had a question. Yes, uh, am I unmuted here? You uh, are. Yeah, okay. So my question is about celebrations. As we are attending a celebration of Elizabeth Bishop her, on her 110th birthday, Key West every year as a celebration of Elizabeth Bishop on her birthday. Um, her 100th anniversary, uh, there were celebrations all over the world um, and there have been many conferences all over the world over the years that have been celebrations of Bishop. Um, when Robert Lowell hit his 100th, there weren't really a whole lot of celebrations. Uh, I kind of am, curious about your thoughts about why we have this urge to celebrate this rather private poet in these rather public and communal ways. Because my sense is that every time a bunch of bishop scholars get together, and I've done this <laughs> dozens if not hundreds of times, it becomes a celebration. Hmm. Any thoughts? Gosh, well, you know, one aspect of that is that I, I think that also to Elizabeth would be much to Elizabeth's surprise that I think her reputation has, um, you know, I can't say eclipsed, but I think, you know, more of my students know Bishop's poems than know Lowell's poems. And so there's, I guess, a greater, broader group of people who are um, in a celebrating mood um, when these times come around. Um, but I also think there's a way in which because she was such a private person, one continues to feel she's a, your private discovery. And so when you find somebody else who has that same private passion for her, you, that's something to celebrate. It's a little bit, um, you know, like a, a secret society to some extent to enter into that secret life of Elizabeth Bishop with others. What, what do you think, Lloyd? Well, I mean, the, the amazing thing is 
and it doesn't usually, it doesn't always happen this way, is that she really is a great poet. <laughs> and, and she, she really speaks to her readers uh, in, in a very off, often and usually in a very intimate way, but that she's also, because her, her life, you know, I, I think the, the, the Maynard Library in their, in their promo for, for, our, for our talk tonight talk, uh, referred to her as the most famous poet you've never heard of. And, and that, that in a way, especially since her death, she's become a kind of heroine and both, both for other poets, but also for people who are not poets, for women, for LGBTQ people. Um, uh, and that the work, the work really holds up when you you know when you when you look at it that that closely um um you know robert lowell was really famous in his during his lifetime he was on the cover of time magazine and and you know and a major character in a in a uh, uh in a norman mailer book and and everybody knew who he was and he was a very public poet political and 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 and, and very public in a, in a in a major way and and i i think you're right i mean there is some way that people who love elizabeth bishop feel that they've discovered her and i think this happened to both of, both of us Mm -hmm. And we were lucky enough that it happened in her lifetime, but that after, after her death, I think especially, um, you know, Steve mentioned, um, you know, a, a book that I co-edited called Elizabeth Bishop and Her Art. And Elizabeth Bishop was alive when I worked on putting that book together. And I couldn't get it published. And then it was only after her death that Donald Hall, who was starting a new series at the University of Michigan Press, contacted me and said, I hear you have a, I, I hear you have a, a book on, on Elizabeth Bishop floating around. I would like to publish it. And he hadn't even seen it. And suddenly, you know, two or three years after her death, people were desperate to publish something, you know, on Elizabeth Bishop or, or, or even, you know, look at more of her work again. And there was a, just a tremendous change in, 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 in the way people regarded her. Alice, do you, do you have any thoughts about that you you've been so um, you've been such an important figure in the in 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 our appreciation of of Elizabeth Bishop, and I know that you've loved her, you know, as 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 long as you could remember, as long as I can remember. Am I unmuted now, Lloyd? Yes, yes. That's so sweet of you to ask. You know. Lloyd, you were noting somewhere that in these uh, remarkable letters to Dr. Ruth Foster, which you alluded to, Megan, um, one of the most amazing moments <laughs> is when she says to her psychiatrist that she hasn't really thought of dedicating uh, poems too much, but she might dedicate this little number at the fish houses to Dr. Foster, mm -hmm. because um, the day she quote unquote saw this poem, she, she and then she describes having a dream in which uh, Dr. Foster is, is principal. And that opened up a whole world to me about poet, poets and their, and, and 
art in general. The day she saw this poem, she saw it from beginning to end. It was an entity. And the visionary aspect of poetry is so um, confidently but humbly described in that letter. And also in that letter, um, Megan and Lloyd, you'll, you'll remember, she says, I've, I've always been so <laughs> envious of painters because once they find their style, they paint the same thing over and over and all of us don't mind. It's a signature, we, we, we love that. Yeah. But I have felt up till now, and that was when she was 36 years old, one of the worst years of her life, as we know, um, because she was so scared about her future and that's what she was discussing with her doctor. She said, up till now, I've thought every single poem needs to be different. And now I've, why, why do I think that way? It's all just one long poem anyway. Mm -hmm. And I think that so many of her peers developed a, a poem, a, a marvelous vessel in which they poured new life. And some of my favorite poets, many of my, my favorite poets through that 20th century era did that, had signature poems, but I, I don't think she does have a yeah, signature. She goes right back to trying to write a different one each time. <laughs> each time, and I, I think, think that's was. part of why she's, we love her so, so much because there's almost an anonymity about that. Hmm that is classic and eternal. And she worked on some of those poems, as we know, for 20 or 25 years, the moose particularly that originated in that year that she was writing to her psychiatrist. But anyhow, that's one of my thoughts that. It's amazing, isn't it, that the poems Megan and I have read tonight were all written by the same person. Exactly, Lloyd. And, you know, we say that she has a signature tone or something, but I don't think that's really it. I think we, it's just that we know them and love them mm -hmm. so much that we, we say, oh, well, it has her tone or, of course, there are the parentheses and, you right. know, the wonderful uh, apostrophe and, oh heavens and things like that, you know, but every one of those poems is so different. But accuracy, spontaneity, and mystery. This is and making there me think. Is, there is a mystery in the heart of every single one of her poems. We had two, two other poems we were gonna read. I wonder if we should just read them. I certainly think that it's- Do we have, do we have time? Steve, are, are we, how are we doing? Read one? I think Lloyd should read Pink Dog. That's what I was going to say. Or is there okay, a good idea? Yeah. Okay, well, tw yeah, twist my arm. <laughs> read Pink Dog, because that really demonstrates what Alice was saying, you know. Uh, yeah, this is um, a poem that uh, Elizabeth was working on for a very long time. And it's actually the last poem she finished in her lifetime. And uh, I tell you my, my, my own little um, sort of secret about this poem, not so secret anymore, I think, <laughs> is that um, it's, kind of, it, it's a kind of parody of The Girl from Ipanema, the famous uh, Brazilian song about the beautiful young woman who is crossing the street and everyone is, is ogling her. And, uh, and I think, I, I think if you heard the tune in your head, dum, bum, 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 it's a kind of samba. And if you heard that tune in your head, you can actually accompany this poem with that, with that song. And it's a very ironic take on, and she was a friend of the, songwriter who, who, who wrote The Girl from Ipanema. So she certainly knew the song. Pink Dog, Rio de Janeiro. The sun is blazing and the sky is blue. 
Umbrellas clothe the beach in every hue. Naked, you trot across the avenue. Oh, never have I seen a dog so bare, naked and pink without a single hair. Startled, the passers-by draw back and stare. Of course, they're mortally afraid of rabies. You are not mad. You have a case of scabies, but look intelligent. Where are your babies? A nursing mother by those hanging teats. In what slum have you hidden them, poor bitch, while you go begging, living by your wits? Didn't you know it's been in all the papers to solve the problem, how they deal with beggars? They take and throw them in the tidal rivers. Yes, idiots, paralytics, parasites go bobbing in the ebbing sewage, nights out in the suburb where there are no lights. If they do this to anyone who begs, drugged, drunk or sober, with or without legs, what would they do to sick four-legged dogs? In the cafes and on the sidewalk corners, the joke is going round that all the beggars who can afford them now wear life preservers. In your condition, you would not be able even to float, much less to dog paddle. Now look, the practical, the sensible solution is to wear a fantasia, a mask. The sensible solution is to wear a fantasia. Tonight, you simply can't afford to be a nysor, but no one will ever see a dog in mascara this time of year. Ash Wednesday will come, but carnival is here. What sambas can you dance? What will you wear? They say that carnival's degenerating. Radios, Americans, or something have ruined it completely. They're just talking. Carnival is always wonderful. A depilated dog would not look well. Dress up. Dress up and dance at Carnival. Great, Lloyd. Hair raising. <laughs> um, Lloyd, oh, you really say hair raising? <laughs> right. I'm sorry. Awful but <laughs> cheerful. Awful but cheerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Published in the New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of her great poems. And, um, so maybe we've hit the end of our evening. What do you think? We've gone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Unless, unless there's, an, there's another question or, or comment. Or I could read Sestina, but that would really take us longer. What do you think? Oh, go ahead. OK, here's Sestina. My other favorite, and you know what a sestina is. The end words I'll just tell you are house, grandmother, child, stove, almanac, and tears. And um, this is written in Brazil, but about uh, Nova Scotia childhood, the loss of her mother to the asylum, staying with her grandmother in Great Village, um, which she began to write about quite movingly once she was far away in Brazil and living and in love with Lata. So. Oh, and I should say this poem was originally, or she first called it early sorrow. Um, you can understand why when you hear it. Uh, she sent a copy of it to her friend May Swenson who wrote back and said, that's a wonderful poem, but you know, is it in some kind of form? Uh, and Elizabeth wrote back, yes, that is a Sestina. I think you should get some, you know, poetry handbooks. Um, I don't know if she changed the title for that reason, but she calls it simply Sestina not early sorrow anymore. September rain falls on the house. In the failing light, the old grandmother sits in the kitchen with the child beside the little marble stove, reading the jokes from the almanac, laughing and talking to hide her tears. 
She thinks that her equinoctial tears and the rain that beats on the roof of the house were both foretold by the almanac, but only known to a grandmother. The iron kettle sings on the stove. She cuts some bread and says to the child, it's time for tea now. But the child is watching the tea kettle's small hard tears dance like mad on the hot black stove, the way the rain must dance on the house. Tidying up, the old grandmother hangs up the clever almanac on its string. Bird-like, the almanac hovers half open above the child, hovers above the old grandmother and her teacup full of dark brown tears. She shivers and says she thinks the house feels chilly and puts more wood on the stove. It was to be, says the Marvel stove. I know what I know, says the almanac. With crayons, the child draws a rigid house and a winding pathway. Then the child puts in a man with buttons like tears and shows it proudly to the grandmother. But secretly, while the grandmother busies herself about the stove, the little moons fall down like tears from between the pages of the almanac into the flower bed the child is carefully placed in the front of the house. Time to plant tears says the almanac. The grandmother sings to the marvelous stove and the child draws another inscrutable house. So thank you everyone for thank coming, you. listening, hearing us out. Thank you, Steve, for having us. You're welcome. And, and thanks so much for coming. And have a wonderful retirement. Yes. And thank you for everything. Thanks so much, thank Lloyd and Megan. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>